our next discussion, our next panel. We're very excited about this one. It's gonna focus on black women breast cancer survivors. We talk quite a bit about the mortality of black women in breast cancer, right? But when do we get to talk about the survival? When do we change the vernacular and the language surrounding breast cancer? So I'm gonna ask everybody, uh, those of you who are survivors in the room, if you are a one to five year survival, survivor, please stand. One through five years. If you are greater than five, up to 10 years, five to 10 years survivor, please stand. If you are 10 to 15 year survivor, please stand. If you are greater than 15 years surviving and thriving, please stand. And here we are, if you're greater than 20 years, we want you to come up to the podium because you are invited to be a part of our next discussion. We're gonna talk about 20 years later, women are still fighting to survive. We'll invite you, would you like to come up? Huh? You know what, come on up, you deserve a seat. So I went off script a little bit, but we're gonna talk 31, high five. Uh, wow. And you know what I think we'll do? I don't know if we have enough chairs for this conversation. So I'll stand. <laughs> because I want to talk about, wow, look at this. No, 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 no. Can we get a group picture, first of all? 20 plus years. We'll go ahead and have you. Right. So I need for Bobby. Bobby Albany to come to the stage at this time. I need for Sheila Pettiford to come to the stage at this time. And we'll have you here. We'll take a group photo. If you just say your name and then the years of your survival and then we're gonna allow our panelists to, to speak. Okay. Um, so I'm Deborah Collier, and I'm 30 years at triple negative and uh, 25 years for uh, ER positive. I'm Roberta Albany. Most people know me as Bobby, and I'm nine years out this month. I'm Sheila Pettiford. Hello. I'm Sheila Pettiford, and I actually stood up at the wrong time. I, uh, <laughs> I, I am an eight, I'm an 18 year survivor and an eight year plus survivor of metastatic breast cancer. Wow. Hi, uh, I'm Sandy Feinstone. I'm a 41 year cancer survivor, <laughs> which is amazing because I'm only 42. Ellen Landsberger, 27 years from ER positive breast cancer, then six and a half years of metastatic disease, and 17 years from uh, uterine, serous carcinoma of the uterus. Wow. <laughs> Valerie Worthy, 23 years this month. Well, and I'm Patty Spears, also 23 years breast cancer, HER2 positive before her septin, um, so, and a one-year primary liver cancer survivor. Wow. I'm Linda Weatherby. I'm Linda Weatherby. Is it on? And um, I'm 21 years from a stage zero DCIS, bilateral mastectomy, and I'm almost 10 years out from metastatic. I'm Katrina Johnson. Uh, I hit my 20 year triple negative this year. Uh, and I've had two additional early stage triple negative in 2015 and 2016, and two melanomas. 
Elise Spatz Kaplan, 31 years, what would have been triple negative if the HER2 antibody had been identified in 1991, that I was HR positive. So all, all points go to triple negative, um, and I feel blessed to be here with all of you. Thank you so much. We're just going to get one picture of our, of our survivors here, and then we're going to go into our panel. So thank you all for, for coming up and being brave enough to share, uh, share in this survivorship and in this moment. I bet in all your years you've probably not seen a scenario like this, a room full of advocates and survivors who are really leading the charge. So we thank you so much for, uh, for your stories and your bravery for being here today. And we're going to talk about this some more because when we talk about the statistics surrounding black breast cancer, it's always in terms of our mortality. We're likely to die, diagnose later, diagnose earlier. Mortality, mortality, mortality. But we're going to speak life in this last panel, and I can't think of a, a better combination of folks to talk about NBC, to talk about being a caregiver, a breast cancer survivor, and, and to really dish out what we need to take away from this as we go into the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. We're gonna see a lot of data, a lot of research. Set the stage for us, set the tone for what we should be thinking about and taking back to our homes with us. So I wanna to introduce to some and, uh, and present to others, Bobby Albany, Sheila Pettiford. Would you both share your story? We'll start with you, Bobby. Okay, I was diagnosed nine years ago with estrogen positive um, breast cancer. And I got into advocacy because of Sarita Joy Jordan. Um, she was the one that taught me about metastatic breast cancer. And I focused my advocacy around that because for me, that was the elephant in the room. Who cares about being early stage when 30 to 40% of us go on to be metastatic, and black women are the ones dying. Wow, thank you. And my story is, as I already said, 18 years ago, I got the wonderful diagnosis, you know I'm being sarcastic, of um, having breast cancer. I was, on, to tell the whole truth, to be very transparent, I did not have mammograms when I turned 40. That's just one of those things that, that I, I have no excuse for, but I didn't. And when I did have my first mammogram, unfortunately, there was an abnormality found and um, turned out that I, it was malignant. So I went through this whole journey with, with breast cancer, initially without insurance. So to, to get this diagnosis, at 45, my husband had insurance because we could only afford to insure him, and I had nothing, absolutely nothing. But I was very fortunate in that I lived in Philadelphia, and there is a, a lovely safety net system that I entered into and quickly did everything I needed to do to get access to insurance. And through, that was through the National Breast and Cervical Cancer Program. So moving forward, that journey led me to this point where I'm here 18 years later, yes, but dealing with metastatic breast cancer. Now that was a complete and absolute shock. Hmm. A shock, shock, shock. You know, a lot of people hear about early stage and so forth and all, and I went through that process with really minimum, really minimum uh, difficulty. I didn't encounter too much of, um, of a lack of access, except for this thing, and I realized that just being here in this room with the, all this wonderful conversation that we've had, I probably was not even offered a clinical trial, not because I was early stage, but because I had Medicaid. Wow. Insurance does matter. It definitely matters. So I hope that's one of the things that we do take into the room when we go into the, 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 um, the symposium tomorrow, that we think about insurance. That is a real part of access. If you don't have what might be considered good insurance, if you don't have any insurance like I didn't have, and the good thing though is I am so passionate about clinical trials simply because 18 years ago, the medicine that I'm on today did not exist. The reason why it exists now is because people did clin clinical trials. So yes, we have a long way to go, 
but the fact that they have happened, even with us not being a part of clinical trials as people of color, as black women in particular, they still have brought me to this point. I have just one child who's a nurse, and with her being in the healthcare profession, you know it was very, very difficult for her to find out that her mother had breast cancer again when she was on bed rest. She was having her first baby, first and only baby, and her mother had to tell her, uh, well, uh, I have this thing. Because I, I didn't even really know what this thing was. Mm. They didn't tell me. They didn't give me the name. I went on Dr. Google to find out that I had an incurable breast cancer. I wound up getting on disability to find out that it was terminal breast cancer. I was so shocked, so, so, so shocked. I did go to a, a, a major health center in Philadelphia, and I was willing. I'm one of those people, even though I didn't have an insurance, that doesn't mean that I was not an unintelligent person or didn't have means. Just because of that, I still did not find access to a clinical trial. I, have a, I had a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful um, oncologist. I don't find fault with her. I do understand what Dr. Lola was saying, that they have minimum time that they spend with us. However, nothing. I told her I wanted to have a clinical, I wanted to, to be a part of one, and to this day, I still haven't. I've had, this is my third oncologist because I moved, and I still don't have access. Wow, thank you. No for information is not, it's really more so. No information has been given to me. I think before you leave today, we probably have you signed up for about five or six portals. <laughs> Um, there's about 10 different search engines among four or five different advocacy groups. And I don't think anybody's going to let you out of here today without making sure that you are connected to, uh, to the support and to the resources. Uh, Bobby, talk a little bit about being a, a caregiver and talk about, um, it, has that been your experience also as a, as a caregiver of someone who's gone through a uh, breast cancer diagnosis? Um, one thing they don't talk about is when you, the patient, become the caregiver. Mm -hmm. um, and to this day, I still struggle with that because my aunt is no longer here. Um, and the goal was for her to have the same response that I did. And as I was caring for her, uh, because she had a rare type of uterine cancer, I asked her, did the doctors talk to her about clinical trials? And she looked at me like I was crazy. So mind you, she was my caregiver. So I'm like, did you forget that along the way? And I pushed her to ask her doctor about clinical trials. So here in Pennsylvania, for whatever reason, the doctors wouldn't do it. So I told her, well, we're gonna go up to um, Sloan Kettering in New York. She did, but by the time she got there, because of her other health issues, she wasn't eligible for the clinical trials. And August of last year, she transitioned. And um, that was very, very hard for me. Um, and it's something, again, as a patient, and you become the caregiver, who's there for you? Because there wasn't nobody there for me, honestly. Um, there were people there, but the folks that were there, one person in particular, she's mad ecstatic herself, and I'm like, I'm not gonna drop my crap on you. I'm, you know, you, you dealing with your stuff. So that's something we need to talk about, but more importantly, we need to get doctors, the oncologists, whomever, to be intentional about asking women, especially black women, about clinical trials. Let's not wait to the last minute, and especially if you know somebody has a rare type of cancer. And, you know, it was, it was hard. So I'm still grieving her um, because, you know, I can't even celebrate with her. I had some good things happen to me, and she's not here. So what do we do? And I think for me, the call to action is that all folks in the medical uh, community be intentional about asking us about clinical trials. Even if it means you have fold, um, posters when they come in for their appointments or have doc buttons and have the doctors or whomever wear buttons that say, ask me about clinical trials. 
We can't keep making excuses that we don't have time for this, that, and the other. We can make time. Be intentional. That's my key for this whole conference. Be intentional. Wow, thank you for that. And I just want to piggyback on that too because of the fact that early stage and in an advanced stage seems to be something that is separate, but it's not. It really, it, we're all in the same arena. And as such, when I went into that first oncologist's office and there was some information about clinical trials, they never discussed it. And the pictures that were on it didn't look like me. So it wasn't something that was really even brought to my attention. I brought it to my own attention because I wanted to fight for my life. And what we have talked about here today, and I love your word, Bobby, intentional. We definitely have to be intentional about whatever time a clinician has with that patient. If they're dealing with early or late stage, it's so important to make sure that there is a standard of care that includes information about clinical trials. I, th I think that's very simple. Has navigating the health system become any easier in 18 years? Have you seen it become more navigable for cancer care? I think, if, I think it, it is if you have the language. Now, I never received a patient at Navigator. No one even told me to go see a social worker. I just happened to have the inner fortitude that I said I'm going to do whatever it is that I need to do so that I'm, so I'm here today. But there's a lot of people who just don't, they don't know how. They really don't know how. So yeah, I say it's a mixed bag in, in order to answer that question. It's a mixed bag. But it can be made easier with the fact that there are people who are willing to volunteer. I'm one of them. People who are already being paid to assist patient navigators. Uh, clinicians don't have to be the only source of income. Just don't go to Google. I agree with him. Don't go to Google. <laughs> but um, yes, we do have barriers. We still have rural areas that really don't have a whole lot of, of um, choices. They really don't have a lot of choices. But overall, to answer your question, I would say things have gotten better. Okay. Last question about advocacy fatigue. Oh, God. Right? We have not touched on this topic. <laughs> But can you talk, I know both of you are active in those spaces and you do a lot of work, you get honored and you know, a lot of thankless work that goes into it. Talk a little bit about what folks need to know to, to combat that, that fatigue and how to, how to navigate that. I don't know what to tell you about that because I'm still working on that myself. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I, honestly, because I don't like to tell people no, I don't like to turn them away, but at, at some point, I do know I have to step back and take time for me. And if I'm being honest, I'm not doing a very good job of that. Because um, I had several people call me um, that were diagnosed. Like one of my aunts was diagnosed with breast cancer. One of my BGR sisters diagnosed with breast cancer. And the first thing I asked them, do you know your type of breast cancer? And what's the answer? No. Um, seriously. And I'm like, really? And then my next question, did they ask you about clinical trial? No. So then I just give them the whole list of this is what you're going to do. And if you need me to be on the telephone with you, we're going to do that. And I have done that. And one of the ladies, one of the survivors, she was diagnosed 20 years ago and got re-diagnosed again. And she called me and was like, oh, Bobby, what do I do? Because you go to this conference, that conference. And I was like, okay, well, what's your type of, you know, the breast cancer, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, you know what, more importantly, ask them about clinical trials. Mm -hmm. Just ask. And to this day, she's on a clinical trial. Wow. That's wonderful. And she started, and she started her online group to educate black women. And she said she did that because I inspired her. Wow. That's wonderful. <laughs> Well, for me, I'm, I'm just learning, especially since I'm of an age and stage where I can't do everything. So I just take it as I do what I can do. But in this particular arena with clinical trials, this is, yes, we're talking about black people, people of color, and clinical trials. 
but the access to the information, not so much the clinical trial itself, but the access to the information is so daunting. I can't stop. I just can't stop. I just met a woman recently. She's a, a Caucasian woman with triple negative breast cancer who has, she told me that she drove 30 hours to try to get into a trial and it didn't happen. And she, and, and just having a conversation with her, my heart went out to her and I told her I would try to do what I could do. I got her involved with the NBC Alliance and we, we tried to help her. She's overwhelmed. She now has brain meds. She's overwhelmed. Clinical trials could probably have helped her, but you can't find one. Not that it's not plenty of information. Yes, I appreciate what you said about the portals and all, but I have, I'm on NBC Connect, I'm on this portal, I'm on that portal, and you have thousands of them that come to you. So it's very difficult. So I can't stop. I can't stop. I definitely take time to self-care, but as far as the advocacy uh, fatigue, I will say this, the hardest part about it is when you get to meet wonderful people, such as the people in this room, and they pass away. That's hard. Can't stop, won't stop. There you go. Okay. <laughs> so in closing, 20 years later, we're still fighting to survive. Give folks some, some hope and a positive message, something that you think they can take back to their organizations and, and rally around. I'm gonna use my favorite word, be intentional. All right. I'm very passionate about that, be intentional. You could be intentional about everything else, be intentional about this. Mm -hmm. For me, the hope is in this coming to fruition. The fact that there are all different parties involved, um, people of all different uh, areas of expertise have come together to listen, to be listened to. That's the hope for me. The fact that I have what you just did with all the survivors in the room, as well as the fact that I have and other people have over eight years, 10 years, even there, on some of the social media groups I have, I'm, I'm a part of, there are people who have lived with metastatic breast cancer for 20 years. So what I say is that this is not the end. And my hope, my particular hope, is that this becomes a chronic illness, not a death sentence. Wow. <laughs> Ladies, thank you. Thank you so much for your candor. Thank you for your honesty. You can have a seat. Well, this brings us to uh, a close, to a happy close. And before we leave this event, I think that we can all agree that we've come together, we have presented the data, we have looked at this thing from every angle, and you know, if this was a feast, right, this was a buffet, a smorgasbord, but the best, I think, is yet to come. It is from the energy in the room, the collaborations that will happen, and what you will take back to your organizations, to your family, to your social media. Please, please do use the hashtags. Please set up watch parties for this. Educate your communities about this event. And we do have some comments, absolutely. We wanna thank our members, our, our industry partners for their support. We wanna thank our amazing speakers. And together, we're gonna to help move the needle forward. I want to acknowledge just before we leave all the subcommittee members for this event, please stand and be recognized. All those who contributed to the Black Women Speak, the first annual, the inaugural Black Women Speak Symposium. And last but not least, I want to invite Stephanie Walker to the stage. She is the project lead of the Become Project, the reason that we were all gathered in this space on this occasion. Stephanie, thank you for sharing your vision, your truth, for doing this work, for creating this space for all of us to come together. Oh, y'all shouldn't have. <laughs> okay, just to close, and um, I really appreciate the um, flowers. I'll have to tell my husband, my other man sent them. <laughs> That's a secret. But anyway, uh, hey, sweetie, I know you're watching. <laughs> but anyway, um, I wanted to take the time to say that, you know, the um, planning committee was, um, that group was a phenomenal group of women. Black women, white women, I, you guys were absolutely 
amazing. But to bring that energy into this room this morning and turn this room into an energy that I never thought that I would see collectively in one place, I am absolutely positively amazed, thankful, and blessed. So go forward to SABCS and let them see what they have to come up against here. The sky's the limit. Thank you, Stephanie. When black women speak, the whole world listens. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for our sponsors. And we look forward to seeing you throughout the halls at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. It's been my privilege to be your MC for this event. Thank you so much for inviting me.